Thank you for taking time this morning to welcome those around you. We do appreciate that. We would like to invite you to make your way back to your chair now. So shake one last hand as you're making your way back. And we invite you to stay around afterwards and hang out and enjoy some fellowship with one another. So thank you for making people feel welcome. Well, this morning we are blessed to have one of our... Uh, what was a young person here a long time, well, not real long ago, but a while ago. Um, the Majerus family is a part of our church. Kathy grew up here, and uh, uh, recently her, her and her husband, Chris, uh, felt the Lord's leading to go to a Christian camp, uh, Trails End Ranch, and they've been there for, since May, June, uh, for a few months, and they are back with us this morning. I love the fact that we have had so many individuals from our church uh, go out into ministry uh, for the Lord. And even those that are full-time doing something that may be not considered ministry still consider it ministry and are doing a great job for the Lord. So I would like to have you help me give a nice big welcome to Chris and Kathy Nathan as they come and share a few moments. Lord bless you. Thank you for coming. God bless you, Chris. Um, I'm looking around up here, and we're probably wondering why, but Pastor Keith told me that if I spoke too long, there's a hole I was going to drop through. And uh, so I kind of want to know where I should stand. And uh, at some point, I might say, Pastor, hit the button, hit the button. Okay? Um, I just want to thank you as a church. Uh, Kathy grew up here. She went to youth group here. And, uh, um, you know, you... Uh, it's funny, Pastor was talking about uh, the church raising Andrew, and uh, I, I just couldn't help but think um, Kathy is, you know, uh, a benefit, or I'm a benefit of, of you guys um, as, far as, uh, as far as that goes. Um, so I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that Pastor Keith uh, allowed us to come and uh, share with you the, the ministry that God has called us to. Um, the ministry that... that uh, we're at. We're, we were there this summer. Um, we're going to go back actually this afternoon. Um, there's a camp in Montana. It's called Trails End Ranch. Um, Kathy and I actually met there in uh, 1999. And then shortly after that, we started dating and then we got married. And, and uh, if you want to know more about that, we can talk in the back. Um, anyway, uh, Trails End Ranch is a sports and adventure camp. We do a lot of different, uh, different things there. Um, we have eight weeks of summer camp, but we do a lot of retreats in the spring and the fall. Um, our goal is to become a year-round camp. Um, sometime, we not really have a timeline, but we're moving towards that goal. Um, it is a full-time position. I'm the uh, assistant director. Kathy is kind of in charge of medical. She's a physician assistant, but she's in charge of um, overseeing a lot of the medical needs at camp and everything like that. But um, how we got there is we, we were just questioning the Lord, and, and not questioning him necessarily in a bad way, but just asking him, Lord, how, how and where do you want us to serve? And, uh, and um, we were familiar with Trails End because we had been there. We, we met there, and then uh, we continued to go back. Every Labor Day, they have a, a, a family camp retreat, so we would go back and reconnect with camp and the friends that we have there and everything else. And one family camp, we were... Um, there, and we were just feeling like the Lord was kind of stirring something in our heart. We weren't sure what it was, um, if, if it was to be just more involved where we were living at the time, or it was to look at different ministries and, and, uh, and try to figure out where he wants us to serve. And so we did that, and, uh, and we kind of uh, just asked him to lead us, and, uh, and just said, Lord, if, if you're willing to lead us, we're willing to go wherever it is you want us to go. And so last, uh, last May, we left to move to Montana and serve as uh, uh, serve at, at uh, Trails and Ranch. It's been kind of an adjustment. It's been very busy. We moved there about a week before staff training started, and uh, we kind of hit the ground running and have yet to slow down. So I guess this last week we slowed down a little bit. We took a little vacation. But um, anyway, uh, Trails and Ranch is a sports and adventure camp, like I said. Uh, we have every age every, every week, which is kind of a neat deal because, you know, let's say a group from your guys' church wanted to come, you could bring third grade through twelfth grade to camp uh, the same week. We have uh, the same the all the all the kids are there the same time. Um, at one point this summer, we had six different camps running all at the same time, um, which is kind of a neat deal, um, but kind of a headache in the programming area. But uh, 
but it, it all worked out. Um, we have horses, we have paintball, we have basketball camp, we have volleyball camp, we have regular camp where the kids can do all kinds of different activities. Three, uh, 35 plus activities. Um, in the back we have a PowerPoint uh, at a, on a table back there if you want to see some of those activities here after church um, and, uh, and stuff. The cool thing is, is that we, try to, we do two weeks of staff training with our summer staff. And uh, we try to use all of those activities and all of the different uh, uh, camps and everything else to really just emphasize biblical truth and emphasize uh, the need for salvation and, uh, and different things um, to help spiritual growth for the kids that are saved and to really help the kids that um, are maybe not saved to, to, uh, to find, uh, find Christ. Um, this, this summer we had 126 salvations and 35 assurances, which was really exciting. Um, we had between, I, I called, called back to camp and asked, what were our total number of campers? And they said, well, we haven't really tallied that yet. <laughs> Which I thought, well, that's kind of strange, but okay. Um, but it was, you know, just thinking back, it was between 750, 750 to about 800 uh, campers for the summer. We averaged right around 100 a week. Um, so 126 salvations and 35 assurances is pretty, pretty cool. Um, it's really cool to be part of camp. I mean, there was one, there was one instance. I, I got to do quite a bit of teaching um, along with the kind of day-to-day -day directing and stuff. But um, I taught every Tuesday night. I taught the staff, and uh, we had a staff meeting. And one kind of neat, uh, neat thing was after our staff meeting, the kids were in their meeting, and we were in our staff meeting. And then after that, we would all kind of meet up at the snack shack and uh, have some snacks and get ready for the night game and stuff. And the staff kind of wandered over there. And we kind of looked around, and we were talking uh, about, you know, if we see a camper sitting off by themselves, we should probably go find out what's going on, um, because that's not typical. Well, I was walking along with this, uh, this girl staff member, and we were kind of just talking, and we saw this, uh, actually, this Native American girl uh, sitting over by this tree. And I said, Rebecca, go, go talk to her. Go figure out, you know, I said, it's, you know, it's a girl. You go talk to her. I don't really want to go talk to her. So... Um, so she went over and talked to her, and, uh, and, it, and it ended up being that um, the girl wanted to accept Christ and was just waiting for a staff member to come and talk to her, and, and, uh, and it was kind of neat. The funny thing about that, or the, I don't know about funny, but anyway, the kind of a, a neat side note on that was Jim, who was the executive director, was speaking at the night meeting, and he had challenged the kids to go s spend 10 minutes alone in prayer. Well, none of us staff that were in the staff meeting knew that. <laughs> so if we would have known that, I probably wouldn't have sent Rebecca to talk to this girl. And, uh, and so, um, you, know, maybe, you know, maybe she wouldn't have accepted Christ at all. You know? But it was kind of neat to be a part of that, and Rebecca was very excited. Another side note on that is just the fact that Rebecca was a horse staff. And we have horses there. We have 44 horses. And um, she's a horse staff, barn staff. And they don't have a lot of opportunity to spend one-on-one -on -one with kids. And so it was really neat that it was, that it was her instead of one of the counselors that got to go spend uh, time with this girl and share Christ with her because she didn't have uh, as the readily uh, availability to do that. So it was a really neat experience for her too. Anyway, what can you as a church or individuals do for uh, Kathy or I or partner with us in this ministry? Well, one of the biggest things that you could do is, uh, is just pray for us. Um, we have prayer cards in the back. If you'd be willing to commit to pray for us, we would certainly appreciate that. Um, I always knew that camping was a kind of a stressful thing for at least eight to ten weeks, and, uh, but I didn't quite know how stressful. Um, so uh, any prayer would be appreciated for us or for the camp in general or for campers that come. Um, so we would appreciate that. Another thing that you could do is uh, to co commit to financially supporting us. We have to raise our own support. Um, we're home missionaries uh, in Montana. We raise our own support. One of the reasons we do that is to keep the camp costs low for campers uh, to be able to come, and, uh, and so we raise our own support that way. So if you would pray, uh, prayerfully consider that, we would appreciate it. You could visit a, a, a work, a visit or, or come and organize a work crew from your church. We'd love to host a work crew or even just a retreat uh, from your church. If you guys would want to do that, we would certainly love to talk to you about that and, and kind of get something going. Um, we're about 10 hours from here, so not a terrible drive, okay? It's uh, a little further than maybe you want to go, but it's worth it, okay? Um, and, uh, but it is, it is fun and it is worth it. Uh, would you want to serve in the summer? Serve on summer staff or serve uh, just a volunteer in the summer? Um, 
we would certainly love to uh, to entertain those uh, questions and things too. Um, but the biggest thing is is really to pray for us. Um, we really need that. We really uh, 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 want that, and and um, you know we just we really need that. So anyway, just a few minutes. I know the hole is going to open here soon, so I better step off. But um, appreciate the fact that you guys would. Uh, uh, listen and entertain uh, what we're doing and just would uh, just ask that you would pray for us in that respect. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. We do want to bless them and their ministry there. Again, they have left jobs here. Uh, and being a phys physician assistant to say, hey, yeah, we'll come out there and work for nothing. <laughs> That's a step of faith. And I, I want to invite you to be a part of their process in this ministry and their step of faith. Again, she is uh, one of our own, and so, Chris, we adopt you as well. <laughs> and uh, we want to bless them this morning as they are continuing to raise their funds to minister there. So if you are making a check this morning, you can make it out to the Church Living Hope Church. Otherwise, again, please find your neighbor's billfold or purse if you didn't bring anything, and you can always, they'll, they'll be happy to let you use some of their money to give this morning. So ushers, if you would come at this time. And we want to pray for them as well right now today that uh, God's blessing be upon them as they're uh, transitioning from a busier summer probably to a more weekend kind of things I would imagine right now this time of year. But still a lot of work to be done. And uh, let's partner together with them and bless them this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for Chris and Kathy and their commitment to serve you and to point others to Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for their willingness to take a step of faith and to venture out on what you have spoken to them to do, um, trusting you for their finances. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be part of, of that uh, journey as we partner together with them financially, uh, but also as we commit to pray with them and for them. Father, we pray that you would bless them in that camp and uh, we pray for protection upon their family as they're there. Keep them safe. And uh, Lord, thank you for so many of our young people that have gone off into ministry. Bless them today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for giving this morning. We appreciate that. Well, this morning we are continuing on in our In the Gap series. Um, we've been studying different characters of the Bible and how they stood in the gap in the stories that we looked at. And you know, people who stand in the gap for others don't come from a standard one-size-fits-all. They're all very different, all very unique. In fact, as, as we looked at different characters, Nehemiah, Esther, uh, Noah, David, and Barnabas, were all very different people with different circumstances, but the call of God in all of their lives was the same, to listen to his voice and to stand in the gap in times of weakness or vulnerability or in times of danger. So today, we are going to look at one of the strangest, at least in my opinion, one of the strangest people in the Bible, John the Baptist. Um, if, if you've been thinking that you don't fit the mold of an in-the-gap person, John is your guy because he didn't fit the mold either. Now, the last of the Old Testament books was, was written about 400 years before the birth of Jesus. And the, the time between is called the silent years. The reason it's called that is because the prophets weren't hearing from God and therefore weren't writing things down. And so it was like 400 years of silence. Uh, I want to share with you about uh, during the summer of 1985, I was doing my internship for ministry in a church just outside of Chicago in Naperville, Illinois. And uh, while I was there, being that I was there, that meant that that summer I wasn't spending the summer with Darla. Uh, Darla and I weren't engaged yet, but we knew that we were like getting really, really close to engagement. And so it was a long summer of being apart from her. And I was thinking about this, It'll, this will tie in here, but uh, I, I was thinking about, and, you know, in those days... Long-distance phone calls were kind of expensive. How many get what I'm talking about here? I mean, you, when, you, when you called somebody, you had your list made of the things you were going to talk about so you didn't forget. And you just went down that list as fast as you could, and then it was goodbye, right? Everybody understand that? Well, some of you are like, what? 
I, I get unlimited minutes with myself. I don't get that. I can call anywhere. Yeah, you got it good. You got it good. All right. So, but I loved when she would send me a letter. And I would get that letter from her, and I would read over that letter and over and over. And I thought, you know what? I think she kept those letters, and I kept my letters from her. And so this week, I, I went into our closet, and I took down this box of, of special notes and cards and letters that we had exchanged to each other. And we sat down on the couch, and we started reading those. And we like, started getting like really embarrassed, like, really? I said that? You said that? And, and uh, I, I pulled out a, a few of those. Um, I have to guard these with all my life today, so nobody else grabs those, but... Um, here, here is one letter I found that she had written to me. Here's the stack of letters I found that I wrote to her. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> this, that is true, but there are more in the box. But these, I, I just wanted to prove that I, I, look at what I did over the summer. Isn't that amazing? Aren't you impressed with that? That a guy would write that much? I mean, but, but one of the cards that she wrote it, on the front, I think this character's name is Ziggy, isn't it? And it says, Sigh. And then on the inside it says, getting along without you wouldn't be so hard if you were here to help. <laughs> Isn't that good? And she writes, Keith, I miss you. Think about you, miss you. Pray for you, miss you. Wonder about you, miss you. Ponder of you, miss you. Dream about you, miss you. <laughs> Talk about you, miss you. And I love you. And that's all I'll read to you, all right? <laughs> There's some good stuff in there, friends. <laughs> Take that on the honeymoon with me, and we'll read those to each other. But when you get something like that, you, you cherish those things, and you hang on to those things, and, and you read those and reread those until the next one comes. A number of you probably have lost somebody special in your life. You've had a loved one who has passed away. And when that happens, it seems as if the little notes that you got from them or the pictures or things like that suddenly become much more significant to you. And many of you probably have notes from a loved one who has passed away that every once in a while you just sit down and you reread that note. And you reread it. It's like it's their last words to you. And it becomes so special that you hang on to that. Imagine how much the Jews would read and reread the last book of the Old Testament, the last chapter of the last book, the last verse of the last chapter of the last book. Those are the last recorded words that God had said through his prophets. They had gone 400 years of silence, and so those last words were read and reread and reread again. They knew those last words of the Old Testament. You will know, you will understand where I'm going with this in just a few minutes, but God's people, they were waiting for the coming Messiah to come and free them. They longed for the Messiah, for his, his first coming, um, they longed for that. They were looking for that. And, and yet uh, the Bible talks about how there would be another man coming to actually announce the Messiah's coming. The, that other man was John the Baptist. And when we get our first description of him, he seems like a kind of a throwback to the Old Testament prophets. Straight out of the pages of the Old Testament is what he looks like. Now the angel Gabriel appeared to John's father, Zechariah, and told the old man that he was going to have a son. Again, he was pretty old. Now, this is often part of our Christmas story as we get to Advent in the Christmas story. I want to read to you Luke 1.13. It says, But the angel said to him, this is to Zechariah, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you. Isn't that a great promise? Your kids are going to be a joy and a delight to you. Hang on to that. <laughs> and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other ferment to drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. 
Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So Gabriel had said John would turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Now that may not cause your eyebrows, eyebrows to go up and your jaw to drop. But if you were living in this time uh, in Israel and you heard the angels say that, you, you would have just been in awe because the words that the angels said were the very last words in the very last book, the very last chapter of the Old Testament. Malachi 4.6 it says, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children of their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. In other words, Zechariah, who knows the last verse of the Old Testament, suddenly hears the angel say this about his son. And he's thinking, my son is the fulfillment of the last verse of the last book of the Bible, of what we hold, the Old Testament. And he was in awe, thinking, this is my son. Well, John would be this bridge between the Old and the New Testament, the promise and the fulfillment. And his, his life purpose was about preparing the way. Preparing the way. John's job was to get people ready for Jesus. He called them to repent he called them to realize that they were sinners and needed to turn to God. You see, his message of repentance is a message of change. It's acknowledging that we need change. How many have ever been driving down the road and you see a squirrel? It comes darting out from the boulevard, starts running in the road, and all of a sudden it's like, it's like going back and forth. Like, what do I do? And it senses something is coming, but it doesn't know. Should I go forward? Should I go back? And if it stays where it's at, it's it's going to die, right? And suddenly it repents. It does a 180, and it goes back to where it was, knowing that that was safety. That's what repentance is all about. Repentance is a message of good news and bad news. How many like to have the bad news first? How many like having good news first and then the bad news? How many don't like news? Some of you didn't raise your hands at all. I'm going to give you the bad news first, and then I'll give you the good news about repentance. The bad news is you're a sinner, hopelessly lost without God's grace and mercy. We're all sinners, the Bible says. The good news, God loves you. He forgives you, and he will radically change your heart and your destiny if you let him. Isn't that right, Earl? Yes, sir. They're going to hear your story someday. Not too long from now. John hadn't read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He hadn't been taken to term school at all. He was a little bit rough, a little bit rough looking. In fact, listen to Matthew's description of who John is. In Matthew 3.1, it says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. I tried to find some this morning to wear for you, but I couldn't find any anywhere. And he had a leather belt, which I, I have that, so around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. So how many are with me today for lunch? We're gonna have, next, next Sunday for Teen Challenge, bring locust and wild honey. We'll just, we'll just have a great meal together. It doesn't sound very good to me, but I mean, imagine he probably, probably smelled some, although maybe baptizing all those people probably helped care, take care of some of that, uh, but his clothing was, and his diet were just a little, a little bit weird. But John was one that didn't sugarcoat his words, and yet people came from all over the region to listen to what John was saying and to be baptized by them. Isn't it amazing? Somebody could tell the truth, not sugarcoat what he's saying, and people would still come and listen. Perhaps there's a few 
pastors, ministers today that need, need to take heed on that. Uh, maybe a few have sugar-coated things, just, oh, let's just water things down a little bit. We don't need to say it like that, or ah, the Bible, it's just a little, you know, let's just change it a little bit. John just told it the way it was, which is what needs to happen. And people thronged. They just came because they were hungry to hear. Now remember, it's been 400 years of nobody speaking on behalf of God at all. Suddenly, here, here comes John, and he's preaching, and he's foretelling about Jesus coming. And, and here's a little bit of what he said in Luke 3, 9. It says, um, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And so for John, it wasn't just say, hey, I repent. It was your life needs to change. When you repent, it's not just a verbal commitment. It's a lifestyle change that needs to take place and, and that God helps you to make that change. So John stood in the 400-year gap between the Old and the New Testament. To, now, to understand maybe some of the hurts and the hopes of the Jewish people in this time, in the first century, we need to go all the way back to Solomon's temple. At the dedication ceremony, the glory of God suddenly comes and it fills the temple. And the people thought, this, this will be this way forever. It will never change. The glory of God will always be here. And yet, uh, just a few centuries later, God's people turned their backs on him. The Babylonians plundered that temple. They stole all the gold, and they tore that building to the ground. The spiritual heart of the Jewish people was literally ripped out. And Ezekiel tells us that God's presence departed from the temple even before the Babylonians attacked. After Zerubbabel and Ezra rebuilt the temple, the people had expected that God's glory was once again going to fill the temple just like he had done before. But he didn't come. So God's people suffered. They waited. They hoped their king would come in glory in this temple again. Now get this. When he did come, hardly anybody noticed at all. When Mary and Joseph brought their baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated, like Andrew. We are told that there was only two elderly people that were there, Simeon and Anna, who were there to witness the event and recognized this is God coming back to the temple. God's glory had come back, but not in a way that anybody had expected at all. Now, about 30 years later, when Jesus appeared at the Jordan River, it was John's like supreme moment. It was everything he had prepared for. This was the moment, and he announced to the crowd in John 1.29, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now, to confirm that this was the Messiah, God sends the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove that comes and descends on Jesus himself. And then John baptizes Jesus in the river. That one for Jesus wasn't a baptism of repentance, but really almost a commissioning of his ministry that, that would now thrust forward and start. And like John, God is calling you and I to be a voice to our family, to our friends, to our neighborhood, to our community, to the world. But in order to do that, he also calls us to, to get out of the way. And that's what John did. Some of you have been part of an organization or you've worked at a job where people kind of expect to climb the corporate ladder. ladder. And you think, I've been here long enough. I should get this position now. And it opens up and you are moved up to the next ladder. In the kingdom of God, it's a little bit different. You see, John's role was to point people to Jesus and then get out of the way. Instead of jealousy, John felt this incredible joy to suddenly see the people not flocking to hear him any longer, but now flocking to hear and follow Jesus. John didn't care about his status or role. He only cared about fulfilling the task that God had given him, and that was point people to Jesus. Point people to Jesus. Point people to Jesus. And that's your, and that's my assignment as well. See, John kind of saw himself like a best man at a wedding feast. 
The best man knows he's not the center of attention. At least most of them do. He's thrilled to shine the light on his friend, the groom, and to tell some kind of fun stories about him so that everybody gets a glimpse of the groom's character, of his personality, of what he's like. At the rehearsal dinner, at the reception, the best man stands up and speaks out loudly and fondly of his friend. But when the speech is over, he fades into the background. The groom and the bride are all that matter. And he's content with that. We get this picture when John makes his announcement about Jesus. I can see suddenly the, this grin just shows up on his face and this excitement comes into his voice as he yells for everyone to hear. Again, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It wasn't about, oh no, he's taking my place. I'm gonna be a nobody. It's all about Jesus. This is why I'm here. It's all about this guy. Follow him. He's the Lamb of God. He's the one that's going to change your life. Fast forward two years. We get a little bit more of a glimpse of John's life. He hadn't stopped telling people about Jesus. He hadn't stopped telling them, repent and turn to Jesus. In fact, he was bold enough to call Herod to repent of adultery. This is the king. This is not a nice man. This is like the dude you want to stay away from. You want nothing to do with him, not even to say hi. And yet John has enough boldness and enough desire for Herod to repent. He wasn't trying to get even with Herod or trying to get mad at Herod or put him in his place. He had a desire that Herod, the king who was evil, would also turn to Jesus. And he tells him, what you are doing is wrong. You are living in adultery. As you might guess, Herod wasn't real excited about what John was telling him. He wasn't like, oh, thank you so much. I just appreciate that. Thank you for loving me. I'll just, I'll have her move out right away. I'm gonna, he wasn't like that at all. In fact, he was mad. It's kind of scary when you have a guy that's mad and has the authority to carry out whatever he wants to do. And that was Herod. Well, Herod wasn't receptive and threw him into prison. Now, in the darkness of his prison cell, even John began to question a little bit, began to wonder. And so he sent his disciples to ask Jesus a question. Matthew eleven three. 3, it says, Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? This is John saying, my life's all about Jesus, pointing people to Jesus. Suddenly he hits a place in his life where he's just down. We've all been there. Are, are, you, are you the one? You know, I love, Jesus didn't react in anger at all. He didn't blame him. He didn't get mad at John for his doubts. He simply sent a message back to John through his disciples and said this in Matthew eleven four, 4. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. <laughs> the blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Wow, that's a powerful verse. This is what you've seen. This is what you heard. Go tell John what's going on. This will confirm to John. The last we read about John isn't, and he lived happily ever after. Well, he did. He went to heaven, but the last few days weren't very good. Look at Matthew 14, verse 6. It was Herod's birthday. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. She must have been some kind of dancer. Uh -huh. Prompted by her mother, she said, 
give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed. But because of his oath and his dinner guests, a little pressure there, they had heard him, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Just pause there for a moment. He withdrew because he was grieving. See, this was, this was his cousin. This was the guy who led the way, prepared the way for him. This was a man who actually now died because he was preaching repentance. He was preaching Jesus. And now his head was gone and he was dead. And Jesus was grieving. He was in great sorrow. And so he withdraws just to have a little time alone. How many know what he's doing? How many have been there before? So thinking, I'll, I'll get away, I'll regroup, take some time to be with the Father. It doesn't happen for him. It says, hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he said, get away from me, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm burned out, I'm grieving. He didn't do that, did he? In his moment of sadness and grief, instead, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. You see, for you and I, the goal of, of every believer, of every follower of Jesus, is to stand in the gap for our generation, for your family, for your friends, for those you work with. To be a bridge pointing the way to Jesus. I'm gonna ask if the worship team would come at this time. And I want you to just to bow your heads as you kind of focus in on your life this morning. And I want to ask you a question this morning. What is God saying to you through the life of John the Baptist? Is there something that God is speaking to you about through this story of John the Baptist and how he stood in the gap? Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about the message of John, about the whole idea of, of repentance. Again, repentance is basically saying, I have sinned, and my sin separates me from God. And I can't work enough to be good enough to get to God. The only thing that I can do to get to God is to accept what he's done for me, and that is sending his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross in my place, so that if I accept his gift into my life, and if I repent from my ways and turn to him, Jesus Christ will come into my life and make me a brand new creation. Maybe the message of John the Baptist says to you, what am I doing in my life to point people to Jesus? Maybe it's saying to you, you know what, my life isn't about me. <laughs> Here I think my world evolves around me. There's others in your life that thinks your world revolves around you too because you tell them that all the time. But today you're thinking, you know what? My life isn't about me. It's about me living out Jesus' plan for my life. With your head bowed and your eyes closed this morning, I want you just to focus in on maybe one of those things I mentioned about this message. Again, for some of you, maybe it's about repentance, about John's message, to turn to Jesus. If that's you here this morning, in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to just right where you're at to make that commitment that John was asking you to make. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Put your name in there. Takes away the sins of Keith. He did that when I was 10. In fact, he continues to do that for me. If you're sitting here this morning and think, you know what, I need Jesus. I need to give him my life. That's why I'm created. That, that's why I have this, this hole in my heart today because I'm missing Jesus. And if I don't have Jesus, I don't have anything. All the stuff I've been working for in life, the things I've been striving to do or be, it's all a waste if I don't have Jesus. 
This morning, I want to repent and I want to give my heart to Jesus. This morning, if you're sitting here and you're feeling a nudge and you feel like, you know what, I need to do that. Right now, as everyone, your head is bowed, your eyes are closed because you're praying and thinking about your own heart. If that's you this morning and you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to surrender your all to Jesus, would you just right now raise up your hand real high just so that I can know if there's anyone that I can just I can lead us in a prayer for today. I'm not going to call you out at all. I would have all of us pray together. Yes, thank you. Is there anyone else? Yes, thank you. Just thank you. Yes, thank you in the back. Yes, thank you. There's five or there's six this morning. Is there anyone else that says, I need Jesus. I need his love in my life today. I need him to forgive me. I need his, him to set me on the right path today. Anyone else? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm just going to wait a moment longer. Is there anyone else? Anyone else? This will be the greatest day of your life. The beginning of a brand new life in Jesus. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. And I'm going to ask those of you that raised your hand, or maybe some of you didn't, but you would like to pray this prayer as well. I'm going to ask, ask you just to pray this prayer out loud with me. So just repeat after me. It's not a magic formula, because you could say these words and not mean a word of it. But if you're sincere with God, Jesus Christ is going to come into your heart, and he's going to transform who you are. Everything's not going to be perfect in your life, but Jesus is living with you. And he's helping you along the way. And your names will be written down on what the Bible says is the Lamb's book of life. Eternity would be yours in heaven. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for loving me and sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me. I do confess that I have sinned. But I now invite you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And help me to live a life that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, we have a little gift we'd like to give you. It's just a little booklet that's going to help you to just kind of start out your journey with the Lord. And, and there's a couple in the church, Mike and Irene. Mike is back here. Irene's sitting up here. They just would meet you right over here on this side by that bigger speaker to give you that gift and answer any questions you might have. So at the end of the service, we would invite you to make your way over there and receive that, that little booklet that will help you give the Lord. Right now, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing this song. And then I'm going to come back and close in prayer by praying for a couple of the other things that I ask you to think about in your own life this morning. Because everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on.
back and put up the, the part that says the, about moving the mountains. A lot of us, when we sing that song, we think so much about the mountains of our life, the circumstances we're facing, financial things, whatever it might be. As I'm singing this song, I think more about people who we think, ah, there's no way that they're going to give their heart to Jesus. There's, there's just no way. It's, it's impossible. My God is mighty to save. Nathan's brother Aaron's here today. A graduate of Teen Challenge, what, six years ago? Six years ago. Probably some of the family said, ah, I don't know about Aaron. No, I, don't, I, I just don't know. He's a worship leader in a church now. God is mighty to save. Mighty to save. Amen. Amen. This morning we have a, a new member of our family that's here in church today. Just on Thursday night with my nephew graduated from Teen Challenge in Brainerd and Earl. It's awesome to have you here today. God's doing a great work in your life. Amen. But Earl, I would, I would venture to say there's people that said, ah, oh, Earl, God, <laughs> no way. There's just no way. Chrissy, you were probably one of those. God is mighty to save. Mighty to save. Mighty to save. This morning as we close, I want you to think about John's life. His whole purpose was to point to Jesus and get out of the way. Just point to just about Jesus. Just about Jesus. As we close in prayer, would you lift up a name or two, a loved one, a friend, that right now is struggling, is hurting, desperately needs Jesus. And would you pray for them? And I'm going to give you a moment to do that, and then I'm going to close in prayer this morning. Let's pray. Lord, today we are not a people that are without hope. We're at a church that says living hope. We believe in that hope through Jesus Christ. And we lift up our friends, our family to you that desperately need to know about Jesus' love. That so many of them feel like they're so unworthy that there's no way that God would ever accept them after what they've done. Lord, I pray that your love would invade their heart today. They would know your compassion, that they would know how much you care for them, and they would give their heart to you. Lord, I thank you for that. Next week, we will, with, with several individuals from Team Challenge, celebrate the fact that God can move mountains. And Lord, I just pray that you would give us opportunities to point people to Jesus this week as we go from this place, but not from your presence today. We ask this in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you as you go. Be sure to visit with the Nathans at their table back there. Also, if you raised your hand earlier, please come down to the speaker down here, and Mike and Irene will meet you and give you a gift. As always, our altars are always open if you want to come and just wait in God's presence. May God bless you and give you a great Lord's Day today.